Hi, this is a revision video for GCSE English Literature. We're looking at Animal Farm by George Orwell and this video gives an overview of chapter 3. By overview I mean a summary of events, a look at the key characters, some analysis of key quotations. If you just need the overview of the chapter I do cover that first so let's move over here now to give a summary of the events in the chapter. Firstly, the animals complete the harvest and they're happy in this chapter. It shows the initial positive impact of the rebellion, although as readers we can already see the pig's corruption creeping in. We learn of a meeting that takes place once a week, and although the animals vote, all well is clear that the resolutions were only put forward by the pigs, so we understand that the other animals have no real power or autonomy. The pigs take over the harness room as a headquarters, again another indication of power, the farm is no longer a space for all animals to use, and in segregating themselves we see a form of elitism emerging. Snowball starts his committees in this chapter. We do cover these later, but remember they're not successful. And as part of Snowball's committees, the animals are taught to read and write, although they don't really achieve full literacy as the pigs do, and those that do pay no real interest in it. Squealer's speech towards the end of the chapter gives a brilliantly persuasive argument as to where the milk went, Let's put a quotation here. The mystery of where the milk went. The mystery of where the milk went to was cleared up. And thus we understand that the milk is for the pigs alone. Right, let's move straight on to the setting. This chapter is set on Animal Farm and we learn that the harvest has gone well through sheer hard work. We're reminded once more of the pig's intelligence. And this leads up to the next point again with the quotation that the pigs did not actually work but directed and supervised others. There's a crucial line in this chapter. With their superior knowledge it was natural that they should assume the leadership role. Now I'm going to circle natural and assume here and we'll return to this very shortly. Uh, now before we come back to that let's just pause and consider Marx's views on leadership. Now Karl Marx believed it was possible for leaders to maintain the best interests of the class from which they came. And that meant that Marx thought that as a working class person, a, a member of the proletariat, a, a leader could still care about the working classes and lead in a way which preserved the working class's interests. Now, I just want to put a photo up here of somebody else called Bakunin. And this man was a Russian revolutionary. But rather than being a communist like Marx, he was an anarchist. And you should look this up if you want to know more about anarchy as a philosophy, because we don't have room for it in this video. But Bakunin believed that it was not possible for workers to continue to represent the people once they had become leaders. And I've included this here because you ha you could re think really hard about this in terms of Animal Farm. What is Orwell suggesting about leadership? Do you think the pigs really still represent the other animals or have they just become self-serving? It's certainly something for you to think about. Now, I did say that we'd look at the language in this quotation, so let's return to it. The pigs are described as having superior knowledge. We're told it was natural that they should assume leadership. And this is not the first time we're told it's natural that the pigs should take leadership. In chapter two, we were told that the teaching and organising the others fell naturally to the pigs. So in this language, we easily accept the authority of the pigs, the reader's acceptance aligns with the experience of the other animals. And the language here applies that having the pigs as leaders was the only option and that the pigs quietly but forcefully seize control. And it's already possible at this point to compare the pigs with Jones. Now I mentioned that the animals are happy in this chapter so let's move over here and look at this a bit more. And a quotation for you, the animals were happy as they had never conceived it possible to be. And when you're thinking about this, isn't memory an issue for the animals? I mean, by chapter six, we know that they waver in their conviction as to what actually happened in, in the rebellion and their recollection of the resolutions. Another quotation for you. Every mouthful of food was an acute positive pleasure. This is really to do with um, food as something enjoyable and something necessary for the animals. And food has always been a pleasure for them. We know at the beginning that when Jones neglects them, food is a real driving force. So actually, we need to think about the extent to which this is um, a measure of happiness among the animals. 
Uh, it's also talked about the food not being doled out to them by a grudging master, but we know by the end of this chapter that the pigs are essentially stealing from them. So they do have a master, and they do have a master who begrudges them the milk and the apples. And lastly, um, talked about the, the it talks about with the worthless parasitical human beings being gone. But there's an irony here. The pigs are parasites, and while the animals don't recognise this, the reader certainly does. Right, now we're going to focus on Benjamin, the draw a quick donkey. Now, he can represent the older population, or the uh, Menshevik intelligentsia. He's an intelligent uh, character, but he's forced to live as a marginalised character. And I think it's really important that you don't get too hung up in reading this novel on exactly which character represents who in the Russian Revolution of 1917, because it's fairly, fl well, it's relatively fluid and you will end up derailing your thoughts and your study and your revision if you become fixated on who represents whom. There's there's lots of interpretations that are, that are valid here. So let's look at Benjamin and his qualities and what he represent what he does in the in the novel he's wise he's seen many changes he doesn't comment and he won't interfere and we can assume that's because he understands the true threat of the pigs he's still alive at the end so he's right none of us have ever seen a dead donkey and he does witness the final scene in chapter 10 when the pigs are interchangeable with the humans and it's benjamin who reads the final commandment all animals are equal but some animals are more equal than others and benjamin sees the cyclical nature of power and corruption and he'd implicitly kind of predicted this with his phrase none of you has ever seen a dead donkey he's saying when he says that he's he's discussing that the fact that he's seen a lot go around and come around and the others perhaps haven't. Now let's move away all the way up here and have a look at Snowball's committees. I put these up, you don't need to learn them, but we had the Egg Production Committee, the Clean Tails League, the Wild Comrades Re-Education Committee, give you a quick wrap, Wild Wool Movement, a quick sheep, and classes in reading and writing, but on the whole these projects were a failure. Now these committees were a distraction, they represent the idea that bolt-on surface level projects or committees cannot ever solve the deeply rooted political problems of the farm. And we also see, see a clear distinction between Napoleon and Snowball here. Napoleon thinks these committees are a waste of time and sets about training the nine, nine puppies. I suppose at this point we could say he's already mobilising his forces to expel Snowball. And here Orwell shows the deep divide that runs between the two leaders, perhaps prompting the question as to whether it's ever possible to hold for two people, or pigs as it were, to hold power. Now let's just consider this idea that knowledge is power something that comes up a lot in the novel, this theme. And the animals don't really learn to read, but the pigs become more and more knowledgeable. And so they continue to embed their power while the other animals continue to be disempowered. And it's also in this chapter that Snowball reduces the commandments to the maxim. A maxim is a simple rule, easy to say and remember usually. Four legs good, two legs bad. Now, the analysis of this is you can look at is that in reducing the commandments to such a simple phrase, Orwell shows us how the reduction of language is dangerous. There's no opportunity for nuance or developed thinking with this simplistic maxim. Now, lastly, um, I'm going to put up Squealer's speech, which comes right at the end of this chapter. And right now I'm just highlighting all the pronouns. But in these pronouns, we get a clear sense of united leadership. We know it isn't necessarily true, as we're seeing cracks appear in Snowball and Napoleon, but Squealer wants to promote this idea that the leadership is united. Now, let's look at this repeated you. Um, Orwell and Squealer, or, or sorry, Orwell has Squealer use direct address, and this gives an immediate and personal appeal to each animal. And there's also a mild threat here. Surely there is no one among you who wants to see Jones back. I mean, of course they're putting fear into the animals who take this speech at face value. But there's also the implication, almost of surely none of you will challenge us for those animals who do understand. So think back to Benjamin there. And this speech is an example of Orwell em employing uh, clear rhetoric. For After all, Squealer is the propaganda machine of the farm. So when he says proved by science, he's making his argument irrefutable. That is, you can't argue with it. 
and we still see this in advertising today really but um that's certainly a technique used here and i'm now highlighting your sake and pleadingly and failed in our duty and again this idea that jones could come back i'll highlight that again because these are highly emotive and here this query as to whether the animals think that the pigs are acting out of selfishness and appeal uh, selfishness and privilege appeals to the animal's sense of integrity and trust of course the animals would accept such an argument which starts with such a humbled rhetorical question now let's return once more to this argument that jones could come back the laying out of this argument that the pigs are caring for them now and that if the pigs were to become weak so by losing their milk and apples then jones would return sounds logical and it's not of course and we know this the reader knows this but the animals are given a sense that they're able to follow a logical argument and so will believe squealer and when he says that the whole management and organization of this farm depends on us he's establishing himself as being in a position of authority look at those words management and organization there now if you want to learn more about rhetoric you need to look up pathos logos and ethos that's the appeal to the emotions the logical mind and establishing authority to speak if you're aiming high then that's well worth doing it's certainly employed very effectively here and so the chapter ends and the milk is for the pigs alone. Now, I think we're going to leave this one here. I'm going to push on with chapter four, chapter four as soon as possible. I won't leave it two years this time. Sorry about that. But thank you very much for watching. <laughs>